You've probably all heard of Arnold Schoenberg. Modernist composer, and in the words of Wikipedia, which, uh, which as, a, as characteristic are very succinct, he developed, sorry, yeah, he coined the term developing variation and was the first modern composer to embrace ways of developing motifs without resorting to the dominance of a centralized melodic idea. So music without a meta narrative. And if you ever heard it, it's it's like poetry that's sort of half spoken, half sung over. It doesn't sound that good. Is really what I'm trying to say. I mean, it, I don't want to say it doesn't sound at all euphonic, but it's it's a little grating in its own strange way. And this was very controversial at the time. And the Nazis, in fact, labeled it degenerate art, along with jazz. Again, according to Wikipedia. Uh, and it'd be easy, you, of course, you have to look at Schoenberg in context. And he is working in the shadow of Nietzsche and in the waning shadows of God, uh, you know, in, in the wake of God's death. And, of course, from Germany. And he's, you can really see his music as a commentary on that. Um, and it, it would be easy from there to say that oh, Schoenberg represents, as an individual, kind of where Germany was and where the world was going to be now that God was dead. Um, but a friend of mine who got me into Schoenberg, who's very, very musical, uh, told me this story, and I cannot verify it at the moment, but I like it, so I'm going to share it anyways, where Schoenberg was once witness to have been listening to Mozart, I think. Uh, maybe somebody else. But he was listening to Mozart, and a pained expression came over his face, and he said, kind of wistfully, I wish I could write music like that. Uh, by which he meant not, I wish I had the talent to write like that, because he, he manifestly had it, but that he wished that he'd lived in an age where he could write that kind of stuff, where that stuff was still acceptable. Um, and I think it's interesting that he felt as an artist that he needed to not defer to the culture, but he needed to incarnate the culture he was in in some way. He had to speak to it. I think that's something people have to bear in mind when they, especially uh, religious believers, when they're critiquing art, is that um, it's a sort of truth that's so obvious you miss it. It's like wherever you are, you're there. You know, We are living in modern times. And art does not exist in a vacuum. It, it needs to draw its vitality from and its source material from modernity. And that's why I really appreciate somebody like Sufjan Stevens, who I think writes with a decided Christian perspective, but his music... Um, it appeals to a very, very specialized kind of uh, intelligentsia, if you want. Uh, there's, he, he appeals to a certain style of music that really is very, very contemporary, and I don't think there's really analogies to it any other time in recent memory. Um, but he really has his finger on that pulse. And so art needs to be in the zeitgeist in order to be real art, to be meaningful art that will affect the culture. And Christians should bear that in mind, I think, before they start um, breaking out their degenerate art stamp and labeling everything with it. Um, and my point is, there is that dangerous volatility to art, um, that it does lend itself to that kind of misinterpretation sometimes. Um, let, me, let me take an example. The Empire State Building. I was, I was prompted to make this video because I read yesterday that the Catholic League... Um, tried to get a tribute to Mother Teresa on the Empire State Building. Uh, they were that, that offer was rejected, or that question, uh, that request was rejected. But of course, last year at the 60th anniversary of Mao's revolution in China, the Empire State Building, that symbol of progress and free market capitalism and industry and enterprise, was lit up red and yellow in tribute to China and its economic system. And of course, this pissed a lot of people off. Um, and this is where you have to go to Andy Warhol and him pointing a camera at uh, the Empire State Building for six plus hours and then making a movie out of that because there's something that really needs to be contemplated about the Empire State Building. Ayn Rand, um, of course, wrote the novel of Fountainhead and she extols the skyscraper as the pinnacle of architecture because she believes that architecture is primarily, it, it comes from the architect. She, she really views capitalism in terms of these sort of great men. And I mean that in like, like capitalized, I mean like Carlyle's heroes, um, whose ideas uh, shape everything else. I mean, everyone is sort of, everyone who works on a building that Howard Rourke designed is working within his image, kind of. Um, 
And um, of course, Ayn Rand's offices were on the Empire State Building, and she really viewed that. See, the, the fact that skyscrapers are so individualistic and they scrape the sky and so forth, that's why she thought that they were more ethical and more aesthetically true than uh, a cathedral or something. And of course, the Empire State Building for her represented that in spades. Here's the thing. The Empire State Building was built by many people. <laughs> there was more than one intelligence involved, more than one, more than one mind involved, but um, the chairman of uh, the construction company that built the Empire State Building was a guy named Al Smith, who was the first, first Catholic um, candidate for the presidency in 1928. And after he lost the election, this was the project that he took up. And uh, through his influence, uh, they started building the, um, the Empire State Building on St. Patrick's Day, on March 17th. And um, its sort of grand opening, where his grandchildren cut the ribbon, was May 1st, which of course is May Day. It's Labor Day. It's like International Workers' Day. And it was supposed to represent the fact that it, it combined everyone's interests, that it was a collective effort. Um, so you have this, you know, this Catholic building. Um, well, I shouldn't say a Catholic building, but I mean, what else would you call it exactly? It had an eye towards labor unions, and it was chaired by a Catholic, and, uh, you know, opened on a Catholic holiday. And, of course, now Mother Teresa can't get a tribute on it. Um, but it really shows you there's a certain, you know, the fact that this thing, and, and, of course, the photographs of it being built are now, I mean, you see them hanging in, like, restaurants, you know, that are New York-themed. Uh... What do those pictures symbolize? Do these pictures of these guys sitting on these beams suspended in the air, you know, eating their lunches and whatnot, I mean, uh, do they represent you know, the vision of Al Smith being realized, or do they represent how the Empire State Building is really a thing that grew up from the collective effort of these individual workers working in community? That's the volatility of art, you see. Um, how much time do I have left here? Not much. So I'm just going to, um, yeah, I think at this point I'm going to post a link to a friend of mine's, oh, and, and that goes the other way as well, um, insofar as, I'm just going to say this as well, Piss Christ, the photograph of the crucifix in the urine. I'm going to post a link to a nun talking about that and to an article on the Piss Christ controversy about the theological questions we can ask in relation to Piss Christ that it raises, or something that was intended to be blasphemous when viewed through the sacramental imagination, so I think it's on a whole new component. Um, so that goes in both directions. Something that is originally meant as a as a Catholic themed piece of art can be co-opted um, by more than one. I mean, by free market capitalists or by communists alike. Or on the other hand, something that's meant as blasphemous can be read through a Christian lens. And I'm going to post a link to well, a couple of links to um, one of them is to the YouTube page of a friend of mine. Um, who you may know here on YouTube. And then I'm going to post a link to his Facebook fan page. He is a really good artist. I really appreciate his work. And he, I think, epitomizes a lot of what I've been talking about. Um, anyways, I'll post those links, and I hope that this video provided some food for thought for you all. Take care. And once again, I'm leaving the end of my video. I'm, I'm just going to let camera run for a little while because YouTube cuts off the end of my videos sometimes. So that's what's going on here. Mm.